I received an interesting email from a friend of mine at the Centre for Time last week that I need to share with you. The content of the email was this. We've been challenged to a drawing competition by a metaphysics class in Sydney. So this is a friend of mine, uh, Adrian. He, he is actually part of it. He made this. I didn't make this. <laughs> he made it and sent it to me. I'm like, yeah, OK. <laughs> if you want to make a movie. Okay, so before, before we talk about what you might do in nearby possible worlds, uh, I should say that for some reason which rather escapes me, Dave Chalmers has actually agreed to adjudicate this contest. All right, so David Chalmers is possibly one of the most well-known metaphysicians in the world who also happens to be a friend, more of a friend to Adrian than really to me. I don't really know the guy very well. And he will be looking at these... Um, blueprints of time machines and judging the best time machine. Apparently there are prizes. I don't have a prize to give you, so maybe Adrian does. I tell you what, the best one I will pin on my door for the rest of the year. And you can, whenever you walk past my office door, you can look at it and feel warm and fuzzy inside. I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good prize, right? I'm not cheap. Okay, so uh, the idea is that you draw a blueprint of a working time machine. And you submit this blueprint to me by the 15th of April. All of the blueprints from this class and the Reality, Time and Possibility class at the University of Sydney will be given to Dave Chalmers, who will look at them and decide on the best one. Any questions? Yes. Well, I mean, if you can build a working time machine, then have at it. <laughs> It's just literally a picture. Do we have to like, incorporate elements of metaphysics into it? Yeah, so the, the, if, the more you incorporate about the relevant elements of the course, I'm sure the better it will go for you. Yeah? Uh, so I think Adrian said it will be judged along the dimensions of creativity, metaphysical reasonableness, uh, stuff like that. <laughs> I, don't I don't know exactly what Dave Chalmers is going to think when we send him a bunch of pictures <laughs> of blueprints from time machines <laughs> drawn by two different universities in Australia. I, I really don't know what that's going to do, but I kind of want to do it anyway. So can you build a movie? Yeah, if you want. I don't know, I don't know how that will work out, but feel free to make a movie instead of drawing a picture. I would like to watch that movie. Yeah, and, I, well, there has to be the DeLorean in there. And the TARDIS, and this lightning is somehow important, I'm sure. And there's Dave Chalmers. <laughs> anyway, let's do some philosophy. But 15th of April, you've got, okay? Feel free. Ah, oh, there's a peanut gallery. Yay. <laughs> I was wondering if you guys were going to turn up. Thought I might be able to get, get through a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. You guys are awesome. All right. Um, because you came in late, you'll have to look this up online. That was the fun part of the course. You say, is it seven already? Shit. I say, is it seven already? Fuck yes! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, today we're going to be talking about presentism and special relativity. We're going to be looking at the main problem for presentism uh, from STR, which as I've mentioned previously, is more serious than the sort of problems against dynamic theories of time generally. And I'm going to look at a range of solutions, each more fanciful and majestic than the last. 
Okay, last week I told you about presentism and relations, right? So the problem facing presentism from cross-time relations, relations between things in the present and things in the past. These seem to be a problem because relations seem to bring with them the existence of their relata. And it looks like there are a range of features of the metaphysics that seem to require relations of this kind, right? So if you want to have causation between the present and the past, looks like you need causal relations between present and past things. If you want, uh, if you want semantic relations, such as reference to the past, you're going to need uh, cross-time uh, referential relations. If you want attitudes toward the past or uh, general uh, comparisons between present and past things, these are all going to require relations of some kind. One of the sort of central solutions that the presentist has at her disposal is to argue that the relevant features of the metaphysics that seem to require relations don't in fact require relations. And we can tell a story for each given feature that recovers that feature without the need for any relations. So we saw how this works with causation. If you want causation, one thing you can try and do is reanalyze causation using a counterfactual theory of causation because counterfactuals don't seem to require underlying relations or processes. And if they don't require underlying relations or processes, then it looks like causation of that kind would uh, avoid the general problem of cross-time relations. I then told you about my particular crazy response to this uh, issue, which is to extend the notion of the present, make it a little bit thicker, and then use overlapping events in order to recover uh, causation. Why would you do that? Why? Because you might want something a bit more robust from causation than counterfactuals alone. One of the central arguments that people have offered against the counterfactual theory of causation, well, is it an argument? I don't know if it's an argument. It's more a statement which goes like this. Where's the biff, they say. And by that, they mean, where is the stuff smacking into other stuff, right? It looks like, although we didn't like the sort of basic mechanistic theory of causation, I think we could all get on board with the idea that there's something to it, right? That causation at an everyday level does sometimes involve things smacking into other things. Counterfactual theories just sort of do away with that notion of that aspect of causation. It's just not a necessary aspect of causation. You might want to put it back in as a necessary aspect of causation, and if you do, then the problem of relations is going to bite you uh, as a presentist. So, thick in the present, have the best of both worlds, or the worst of all possible worlds, depending on your view. All right, so this week I'm going to go through the argument against presentism from special relativity and tell you about the solutions. There are many solutions to this problem. I don't think, I think that one of them is plausible, which is the one that we'll look at at the end. The rest of them are various shades of what. Why would you do that? Okay, so basic, two basic postulates of special relativity. We're not going to go into a great deal of detail about this, but you just need to know these basic ideas in order to see how the argument works. First postulate, light travels at the same speed in all inertial frames of reference. So no matter how fast you're traveling, light's always traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second. Second postulate, the laws of nature behave the same way no matter how fast you're traveling. So if you're on... Um, if you're on a boat and you're traveling at a constant speed and you're down in the cabin, like down in the, under the deck, and you're trying to carry out some experiments to determine how fast you're going, there is no experiment you can carry out to determine how fast you're going. Right? All frames of reference are the same from the perspective of the laws of physics. Right? You can you know, drop balls, I don't know, play with different physical systems. They'll all behave exactly the same way no matter how fast your boat is going. So you can never work out how fast the boat is traveling at, at least from within, a, within the boat, which is kind of weird, right? Okay, so just to see how odd these sorts of ideas are, here's a comparison between uh, shooting a bullet from an airplane, uh, passing, uh, passing, a bullet passing an airplane versus uh, a laser passing an airplane. So if, you, if the bullet's passing the airplane and you're on the airplane, then the bullet is going to be seen to be traveling at a different speed to the person who's on the ground. Right? So when you measure the speed of the bullet passing the airplane, it's going to be traveling slower than if you measure the speed passing you on the ground. But that doesn't work with light. Light will be passing at exactly the same speed to the person on the ground as the person traveling at the air in the airplane. Okay. Um, there you go. There's my uh, horrible clip art for you. And so 
That, so that's just the basic uh, postulate involving the speed of light. Second postulate involving the laws of nature. There's no experiment you can carry out. So this was, this, a lot of this was to do with, um, you know those stories about Galileo dropping cannonballs off the Tower of Pisa? Some of that stuff was related to this idea of Galilean relativity, the idea that the laws of nature behave the same no matter how fast you're traveling. Anyway, uh, so if you're shooting, dropping a cannonball off the Tower of Pisa uh, versus, that's a spaceship, dropping, shooting a cannonball inside a spaceship, then it's got flames out the back, it must be a spaceship, uh, then the cannonball will behave in exactly the same way. As long as the spaceship's not accelerating, things change when the spaceship's accelerating. As long as the spaceship's traveling at a constant velocity, Dropping a cannonball off the Tower of Pisa, same effect as dropping a cannonball in a spaceship. Okay. Next thing we need is uh, an answer to the question about how you determine simultaneity, right? How you determine the simultaneity between events. So Einstein has a particular operational definition of simultaneity. His operational definition of simultaneity is to define simultaneity in terms of signaling between events, right? When I say operational, I mean testable de definition of simultaneity. Right? So he's not sitting in his armchair just thinking, well, what is it to be simultaneous? Oh, it's to be objectively present. Uh, that's how we determine simultaneity. He's not doing that. He's thinking of some test that you could carry out to determine whether two events occur at the same time or not. And the test that he comes up with is uh, basically involving signals traveling from events. Right? When signals traveling from events reach an observer, at the same time, then we determine those events to be uh, simultaneous, right? So if you see two lightning flashes and the light from the lightning flashes reach the observer at the same time, then we're going to say that they're simultaneous. If the light from one lightning flash hits the observer before the other one, then we're going to say that they're non-simultaneous, right? So all we mean by simultaneity is this sort of signaling definition of when it is to be uh, simultaneous. People have challenged this definition of simultaneity. People have argued that it's a conventional notion of simultaneity, conventional definition, or at least uh, aspects of it are conventional. And some people have tried to use those criticisms of the notion of simultaneity to develop an objection against uh, the arguments that we're going to look at against presentism. You're welcome to check out that sort of aspect of this debate. I don't find that aspect particularly convincing. The reason I don't find that aspect particularly convincing is that it's hard to know how else to define simultaneity, right? So we're sort of not exactly uh, blessed with a bunch of different notions of simultaneity, each of which might be uh, useful for doing science and carrying out various experiments. We've sort of only got this one. And if we've only got this one, maybe it's conventional, but we don't really have much else to work with. Okay, so I gave you this, I think I gave you this thought experiment briefly in the first lecture of some class that I'm teaching. Maybe not this one. Everything's blended into a blur. Uh, this is the train thought experiment. So this is just supposed to demonstrate the core feature of relativity that is going to pose a problem for presentism. This is the relativity of simultaneity. So you've got a train traveling at half the speed of light. You've got a person on the train and a person on the platform. The train gets struck, uh, the two ends of the train get struck by lightning. This person is equidistant between the two ends of the train and when they get struck by lightning, the light travels uh, the same distance to them and they see the two flashes as simultaneous, right? The person on the train is traveling towards the lightning strike at the front of the train and away from the lightning strike at the back of the train. And because they're traveling towards the lightning strike at the front and away from the lightning strike at the back, they see the lightning strike at the front first and the lightning strike at the back second, okay? So if we define simultaneity in terms of signaling between events, then this person, who we're going to call Billy, let's just take an original name for this person, the other person, Susie. Billy is going to see these events at the same time, right? So by, he, by the, the Einsteinian operational definition of simultaneity, he'll, he'll judge the two events to be simultaneous, the two lightning strikes to be simultaneous. Susie, who's on the train, will see one event before the other, see the lightning strike uh, from the front of the train before the lightning strike from the back of the train, and she'll say that the two events are not simultaneous. Right? What is a real problem, or it turns out to be sort of the great genius of relativity, is that if you go back to the two core postulates of relativity, this thing, light travels at the same speed no matter how fast you're traveling, and the laws of nature behave the same way no matter how fast you're traveling, then one thing you can never do is carry out some experiment to work out 
if one of these people is right versus the other one, right? So Billy's judgments about simultaneity turn out to be just as good as Susie's judgments about simultaneity from the perspective of the natural laws. Uh, similarly, Susie's judgments about simultaneity turn out to be just as good as Billy's uh, judgments of simultaneity from the perspective of the natural laws. And so there's no experiment that we could carry out to work out who's right in this case. Moreover, it's not the case that because Susie's traveling towards one of the lightning strikes, that uh, light is traveling slower for her or faster for busy, Billy or traveling at different speeds. You can imagine that if there were different speeds to uh, light, you might be able to say that uh, sh although, sh although that reaches her, although she's traveling towards that lightning strike, it's traveling slower and so it reaches her at the same time as the other lightning strike, something like that. But we can't say that because the speed of light is the same no matter how fast you're traveling. Yeah. Why is we tested it using a series of experiments in the early 20th century called Michelson Morley experiments, they're called. We built these things called interferometers, which basically measure the, the long story short, they're so designed to measure the speed of light if it changes, right, depending on your frame of reference. And these experiments were carried out, and very famously, there was no difference in the speed of light discovered by these interferometer experiments. So we develop the best method we could think of to test the uh, speed of, like differences in the speed of light depending on uh, your, your velocity. And none of those experiments yielded uh, meaningful results that told us that light was traveling at different speeds. They all yielded a null result. And then the interferometer experiments were repeated with more precise devices later on in the century and the same results were, were yielded. So Basically, we tried to find the difference in the speed of light depending on your state of motion. No difference was ever discovered. Could it just be the fact that because it's such a great speed, the errors involved in measuring it kind of destroy all our measurements out there? Well, the interferometer experiments we've done haven't been tested at half the speed of light. right? So we don't have any trains that travel half the speed of light that we can slap an interferometer on. These were testing very, very small differences based on very small differences in relative motion. Um, but something like your suggestion is not far off one of the suggestions that we'll look at in a minute, right? Which is, uh, so these, these experiments were known to Lorentz, who was building his relativistic mechanics before Einstein. And he had a story about why it is that the speed of light, when measured, seems to be the same in every inertial frame of reference. But he argued that, in fact, the speed of light is changing depending on how fast you're going. It's just that when you travel at a certain speed, it fucks up all your measuring apparatuses in such a way that you can't ever measure a difference in the speed of light. Come back to that. OK, so here's the basic objection against special relativity from, uh, from sorry, basic objection against presentism from special relativity. OK, so there exist two observers, O1 and O2, in relative motion, right? That seems fairly innocuous. Whatever is simultaneous with O1 is present for that observer. Okay, so whatever is simultaneous with a particular observer in their inertial frame of reference is present for that uh, for the observer in their inertial frame of reference. Premise two, whatever is simultaneous with O2 is present for O2. Okay, so whatever O2 judges to be simultaneous is present for her. Right? So if you come back to this picture, o, Billy is one observer, Susie is a different observer, and Billy's going to make certain judgments about the um, about simultaneity. Susie's going to make different judgments about simultaneity. Whatever Billy determines to be simultaneous with him, he's going to say is present for him. And whatever Susie determines to be simultaneous for her, she's going to say is present for her. Okay? Seems reasonable. Here's the problem. What is simultaneous with the first observer, right, Billy, is not the same as what is simultaneous with the second observer, Susie. We just saw that here, right? The two, lights of, two flashes of light that were simultaneous for Billy are not simultaneous for Susie. So what is present for Billy is not the same as what is present for Susie, right? They're going to differ. If, if you connect simultaneity to presentness, they're going to make different judgments about what is present. Plug in presentism. Presentism says that all and only present things exist. If presentism says that all and only present things exist, and Susie and Billy disagree on what is present, and they're both equally right according to the laws of physics, then they disagree about what exists. And there's no way to solve that disagreement. So it looks like you're forced 
towards from the relativity of simultaneity into the relativity of existence, right? So you know that old sort of picture that you probably kicked around at some point, according to which what's real for me is what's is not what's real for you, and you've got a, sort of got different ontologies. That's what this view is. As long as we're in different states of motion, we disagree about what exists, right? And sort of worse than that, we disagree about what exists because we're moving, right? Motion is connected up to existence on this picture. Yes. Is existence Yeah, we'll come we'll come to we'll come to something along those lines, right? The idea that and this is connected to to this uh, picture over here where you, can, uh, you can't ever know that the speed of light is changing even though it is, right? Because of certain things that are happening to your measuring apparatuses when you're in relative motion. Uh, and you might try and push it all into the epistemology. Uh, I think it's tricky because you, you end up moving pretty far away from special relativity quite quickly. So we'll have a look at how that works. Okay, so here's a pictorial representation of what's going on. Uh, these, uh, as the, the animation moves, right, as the axes move, those are different inertial frames of reference. We've got two, three different events, A, B, and C, and as you change your speed, the simultaneity of those events changes, right? That line moving through is what people in that frame of reference determine to be simultaneous, and as the relative rate of motion changes, different people make different, view, different judgments about simultaneity. Because they make different judgments about simultaneity, they're going to make different judgments about existence. It looks problematic, right? Okay, and here's Billy and Susie. Susie and Billy are going to disagree about whether the lightning strikes exist. Billy is going to say they both exist because they're both present. Susie's going to say that only one of them exists at any given present moment because only one of because one of them happens before the other one. Okay, so here's the very simplified version of this argument. Uh, premise one: special relativity is true. Premise two: if special relativity is true, then presentism is false. Conclusion: therefore, presentism is false. Right, so there are two options. You can deny P1, argue that presentism, because presentism is true, special relativity must be false. Okay? Second argument, you can deny P2, argue that presentism is compatible with STR. Right? So you can deny the conditional premise. You can say that, look, STR could be true and presentism could be true. They're actually compatible. So we're going to uh, talk about, we can treat these as compatibilist views and these as incompatibilist views. We're going to go through and have a look at uh, each of these different different options. Both of these options have been defended by someone at some point. Option one, I'm sad to say, is most famously defended by William Lane Craig. Does anyone know who William Lane Craig is? Well, I'll leave that as some homework for you to Google. He is a very, very, very well-known creationist. Yeah, that guy. Okay, so option one involves reformulating relativity and telling scientists that they're wrong. Doesn't sound like it will go well for you, but let's see what happens. Option two involves reformulating presentism. Okay? Well, so we'll look at different ways of telling scientists that they're wrong and different ways of reformulating presentism. Okay. Okay, so oh, I'll just skip over that. Okay, so here's what we do. In order, to, so we're going to focus on this second class of options first. These are the class of options. This is the class of options that involves rendering presentism compatible with special relativity. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to render presentisms compatible with special relativity by redefining the present. So when I gave you this argument here, the long form of the argument, we had premises two and three, right? Whatever is simultaneous with O1 is present for O1. Whatever is simultaneous with O2 is present for O2. This presuppose that presentness and simultaneity line up metaphysically speaking, right? That all and only the things that are simultaneous are present, with a pers uh, present for a person. You could deny that simultaneity and presentness go together, that something can be present without, like two things can be co-present, right, present with each other without being simultaneous with each other. Um, so if we're going to say that presentness is not tied to simultaneity, we need to say what it is tied to. Right? We need to give some other account of what the present is. So this is where we come back to space-time, our favorite friend. 
Uh, so one of the things about space-time, what, what relativity tells you is that space and time, spatial and temporal distances, are relative to your state of motion, right? So Susie and Billy disagree about the temporal distance between events. Billy thinks that they're the same distance apart, right, simultaneous with each other. Susie thinks that they're a different distance apart. Same thing happens for space. You have spatial relativity in, in uh, basic relativistic mechanics as well. What space-time allows you to do is... Uh, combine the disagreements that people have about spatial and temporal distance into a global uh, in metric which allows you to make f uh, determinations of uh, distance of a certain kind, spatio-temporal distance, that come apart from any particular state of motion or any particular uh, frame of reference. Okay, so there are, th there are three features of space-time that it turns out all observers will agree, about, agree, ab agree about regardless of their state of, state of motion. And this is sometimes uh, pinned to the causal structure of space-time. So this, this bit here, right, so this is the space-time point. This is called the uh, absolute elsewhere out here, or all of the things that are sort of space-like separated from you. They're the things that, are mo that we sort of typically think of as being spatially distant from us, right? Then we've got the things that are in our forward light cone, the things that are, uh, we can influence causally, basically. And the things that are in our backwards light cone, these are the things that can causally influence us. Right? And in space-time, you have a sort of causal structure that is invariant regardless of your, s your state of motion. Because this causal structure is invariant, uh, it doesn't matter how fast you're going, you won't get relativistic effects uh, in, the, in the sense that we've been looking at, right? Relativity is simultaneity, undercutting presentness. If you take one of these frame invariant notions, one of the features of space-time, and you tie presentness to it. Okay. So there are three options. One option is you say that uh, something is present just in case it's located at a particular space-time point. Right? So you, you find a space-time point in the universe, one that you're particularly fond of, and you say that that is the objective present. Now, in some sense, that sounds kind of crazy, but it's not that crazy when you think about how ordinary presentism works. Ordinary presentism tells you that you've got this sequence of times, uh, each of which is a sort of spatial sheet, and you pick one of those times out as being the objective present, right? And you say that which time it is changes as time passes. On this view, you take a particular space-time point rather than a, a time, rather than a sheet, it's just a little localized region in space-time. You say that that is the present and that as time passes, the point that is the present uh, changes. Second option, what I call bow-tie presentism. Rather than taking a particular space-time point to be present, you take all of the spatially separated things from you to be present. Right? And these are not just the things that are simultaneous with you. These are the things that you can't access going at speeds slower than the speed of light. Right? So these are the sort of things, these are all the things that are causally isolated from you, basically. So you say that all of the things that are present are all of the things that are causally isolated from you. Again, this isn't as crazy as it sounds. In ordinary presentism, when you think about the stack of spatial sheets, each one corresponding to a particular time, and we say that a particular sheet is the present, all of the things that are on that sheet are causally inaccessible to you as well, right? Because you can't travel across the sheet. You can only travel sort of diagonally through the stack of sheets. So you can never just sort of jump across to something that's simultaneous with you and interact with you. So this is sort of the relativistic version, in some sense, of a single, uh, single sh spatial sheet. It's all the things that are ca causally disconnected from you plus a particular space-time point. Second option, or third option, is to go for the light cone, right? So these are the things that causally influence you or that you in turn causally affect, or things that, you can, that can reach you at signals traveling at or below the speed of light, or things that you can reach at, at speeds traveling at or below the speed of light. Okay, so th this view is called cone presentism, and uh, thanks for the <laughs> code presentism. Yeah. Uh, there are different versions of it, depending on how much of the light cone you want to believe in. Uh, so first, first cone presentism says that uh, we just believe in this stuff here, the stuff in the backwards light cone. What that means is that everything you can see, 
is present. Because everything that you can see is stuff that can reach you at a speed traveling at or below the speed of light, right? So that seems kind of intuitive, right? If, if I'm casting around for what it is that I want to be, to, to work, when I'm trying to work out what it is that's present, all the things that I can see, that sort of seems like intuitively it should be present, right? And actually on standard presentism, it's not. All the things that you can see, as I think we're talking about in the tute, are in the past, right? Because there's some time lag between when the thing happens and when you experience it. On this view, the time lag between anything that you can see and anything that, and the time at you, which you experience it, that is all taken to be present. So one of the things that this implies is that if I see a star, right, out there in the universe, when I'm looking up into the sky, that's, that star is present on this view, right? Because it's something that can reach me at a speed traveling out or below the speed of light, right? So it does mean that anything that intuitively we take to be in the distant past turns out to be present. Uh, Claire? You can ask about the star, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. What, what you're actually getting at is, for each of these views, we have to anchor them to a particular space-time point, right? Because each space-time point has a different set of events that can reach it at signals traveling out or below the speed of light. So we have to work out which space-time point we're going to hook it to. Or you can think of it as which observer we're going to hook it to in order to uh, determine which is present. And there are two options. One of them is that everyone's got their own present, and it's whatever each of us sees. But that's going to introduce the same ontological relativity that the first, the original view had, so right? The biggest problem with presentism is that there is no privileged observer. Uh, yeah, you don't need a privileged observer in the original sort of uh, Einsteinian sense in this, in this case. All you need is a privileged space-time point. But it seems as bad as a privileged observer, right? But you could just say that there is just one space-time point, uh, sorry, that all the space-time points have their own present attached to them. So you, you kind of, for all of these views, you're caught between privileging some kind of observer, right, whether it's a space-time point or a particular frame of reference, or not privileging an observer and fragmenting the ontology, right, and you're sort of stuck between those two, and neither of those look particularly friendly. Yeah? Um, so what you just said was that a star will still be present even uh, because we can observe the light, yep. right? I know, but you're seeing that, so it's, it's present insofar as it exists at the time at which it emitted the light, right? Doesn't mean that it exists at the time at which you're observing it, because the time at which you're observing it, it's going to be in here, right? It's going to have persisted into this spatial region here, right? And when you observe it, you're seeing the light from how it was in the past. Does mean that you have to say large chunks of the past are present. But, you know, relativity is weird, so why can't it be weird in this way as well? Uh, okay. So one of the things about cone presentism is that you've got the, the things that I can see and the things that can see me very roughly, and you can define the present as being the things that I can see or as being the things that can see me, and you've got this question as to whether you define it as both the things that I can see and the things that can see me or as just the things that I can see or as just the things that can see me. One of the problems is that we've got no real way to decide between those three options. It's very hard to see why we would pick one over the other. Or we, at best, we can sort of use the asymmetry of causation to try and anchor the present, but that's going to be complicated and difficult to do. Yep. Yep. Motion blindness. It doesn't have to just be what you see. It does have the implication that everything you see is present, but anything that can reach you at a signal traveling out or below the speed of light exists. So anything you hear, anything you touch, anything you smell, all of that will be present.
The present is the moment at which they receive the signal, process it, and have a conscious experience. So it would be it would be the it would be the like becoming conscious of the experience, right? The end result of the processing, I would say. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to know exactly. It depends because there's there's like a causal process right up to the point of experience, and uh, exactly like where you put the space-time point that sort of anchors the present, how deep into that causal chain you go. I don't really, I'm not sure it matters that much, actually, as long as there's something you can do. Uh, I'm just going to press on so we can get, get to some of the less crazy positions, or more crazy. Um, okay, so here are the problems with those versions of presentism that I just gave you. First problem, arbitrariness. You have to either pick a single space-time point and say that that's the present and nothing else exists, or you say that all the space-time points exist relative to those space-time points, and you've just got the same fragmented ontology. So you've got an arbitrariness problem to fix. You've got to say that one particular space-time point is special. But if we could do that, then as Trillo pointed out, then we could just say that an observer is special in the original relativistic picture. Uh, second problem, the past exists under cone presentism. Seems weird, right? Third problem, loneliness. This ap applies to point presentism. Only a single space-time point exists. Space-time points aren't very interesting. Not much going on there. It seems, like I call this objection the objection from loneliness because I don't really know that there's, like a presentist could just bite down on this, but it seems sort of a sad picture of the universe to me if only a single space-time point exists because ain't not much going on there. Uh, third, thir uh, fourth <coughs> objection, the future and or the past exists. So if you go for the picture according to which uh, everything that can see me exists, as well as everything that I can see. Then lots of the future is going to exist, so you're going to have uh, the future and the past. But I think that the most serious problem for these views is I don't really see that they're presentism any longer, especially for the cone presentist who thinks that the entire past exists. So if we think back to why it was that we might have, might have wanted to be a presentist, one of the ideas was it's sort of the folky notion of time, the picture that we carry around in our heads, or at least a sort of best job that we can do at theoretically abstracting some picture from the picture that people carry around in their heads that's coherent. And I'm not sure that anyone's got this in their head, right? No one thinks of the present in this way. And I just don't quite see how it is that presentism can satisfy its own purported motivations in this case. But I'll leave you to think about that. Okay, so now we're going to look at denying P1, right? And if we're going to deny the first premise, we're going to argue that because presentism is true, special relativity must be false. Uh, so the way this works is, well, one way it works is to go back to pre-Einsteinian mechanics and to say that special relativity has to be junked, and you go back to Lorentz's ether theory, which had a preferred frame of reference in it. It had a rest frame, which means that uh, there, was, there was a fact of the matter as to how fast light is traveling, and light travels at different speeds depending on how fast you're moving relative to the absolute rest frame. And if light travels at different speeds depending on how fast you're moving, then when you get to the sort of train thought experiment, you can make it the case that the two events are actually simultaneous because you can change the speed of light in one of the reference frames to get the result out that Susie and Billy will see the, uh, see the uh, flashes at the same time. But what you have to do is that you have to say that the frame of reference is somehow concealed by nature. As I said, there was, we carried out a bunch of experiments at the, in the early parts of the 20th century in order to find such a frame of reference, because everyone did think that there was a frame of reference. We sort of inherited the idea that there should be a frame of reference from the Newtonian picture of time, and we spectacularly failed to find it. It's one of the most important null results in science. And what you have to do here is you have to explain the fact that we didn't find it. And the way that they explain the fact that we didn't find it, which was I was saying to Brody before, is to say that when you're traveling in relative motion, all your measuring devices change shape in such a way that you get the same result out for the speed of light, no matter how fast you're traveling. Right? So, uh, you know, rulers bend and change shape, clocks literally slow down or speed up when you're traveling at different speeds. And because that sort of thing happens, the speed of light, the, the, the true velocity of the speed of light is, is concealed to us, um, and we can never accurately determine what that speed is. So there is a preferred frame of reference. We can just never find it out. Okay? And because there's a preferred frame of reference, you just use that to define what's present. So, right? so if we come back to Susie and Billy, the real problem for Susie and Billy was that 
there was no way to say that one of them was right and one of them was wrong. If there's a preferred frame of reference, then there is a fact of the matter as to which events are simultaneous with other events that's objective and not uh, relative to your, your, your state of motion. And we can actually say that one of these two people is wrong. We can say that either Susie's wrong or Billy is wrong, and therefore that only the events that are present for one of them exist, which gets us what we need. Yeah? Uh, not in this sense. I'll come back to that later, and I'll come back to yours, your question as well, Claire. So I'll just get through this. Um, there's two ways that you can interpret the idea that there's a preferred frame of reference. One of them you could say there's a preferred physical frame of reference. The other one is that you can say there's a preferred metaphysical frame of reference. So what does the difference here amount to? I'm not entirely sure, but it's been proposed by at least one philosopher. The idea, a, a physical frame of reference that's special, would be a frame of reference in which either the speed of light is not 300,000 kilometers per second or a frame of reference in which the laws of nature are different, right? So some frame of reference that violates the basic postulates of special relativity. Um, there is no detectable frame of reference of that kind. But maybe there's a frame of reference that's special not in a physical sense but in some other sense, right? It's special in a metaphysical sense that you can't detect using any physical experimentation. And that frame of reference anchors the present, right? So all of the things that are present in that special frame of reference are the things that exist, but none of the things that exist in the other frames of reference, none of the things in the other frames of reference exist. Okay. So what to say about this? Uh, my view is that that um, option one a involves giving up on special relativity as we know it. Option one b, right? So having a metaphysically privileged frame of reference collapses into the first option. Why does it collapse into the first option? Because if you have a preferred metaphysical frame of reference that's concealed by nature, what this means is that there's some set of simultaneity judgments that are correct, right? And on the presentist view, that means that there's some set of simultaneity judgments which define the present, and only the things that are in that sort of class of simultaneity events exists, okay? Now, suppose someone disagrees with you about what's present. They disagree with you about what's present. They make different judgments about simultaneity. They make different judgments about simultaneity. We don't want to say that they're right. We want to say that they're wrong about the judgments of simultaneity that they make. But how is it that they get the relevant judgments of simultaneity in the first place? Because the relevant judgments of simultaneity that they get seem to be hooked on to a, notion, a set of events that's present for them and not present for us. But if it's present for them and they're getting the simultaneity event, simultaneity relations, uh, simultaneity judgments, then there's some set of simultaneity relations which hooks all the events together that they judge to be present. But a whole bunch of those events don't exist. And because a whole bunch of those events don't exist, then it looks like you've got a version of the problem of relations, right? So you've got one set of simultaneous events, you've got someone traveling at a different speed, they've got a different set of simultaneous events, and they, those, those simultaneous events seem to involve some relations with things that don't exist because they're not in the metaphysically privileged frame of reference. If those things don't exist, then I don't see how they could be simultaneous with you in any meaningful sense. And so you end up saying that some events are simultaneous and some events are not, that some people are right about their simultaneity judgment, some people are wrong, and that just looks like having a preferred physical frame of reference. It looks just straightforwardly contra in, in contradiction to basic relativity. Okay, so, just very quickly, the argument that I think is a good one against uh, this case against presentism. Special relativity is false. It was superseded by general relativity. General relativity is false. Why? Because it's inconsistent with quantum mechanics, right? So one of quantum mechanics, well, probably both of them are, are incorrect, quantum mechanics and general relativity. General relativity will be superseded by quantum gravity, which is a theory of gravity that allows us to incorporate the results of quantum mechanics. Some theories of quantum gra gravity, 